It was a shooting death that took place in an American suburb, but it quickly became an international incident. Rodney Pierce shot Japanese exchange student Yoshi Hattori to death after Yoshi mistakenly rang Pierce's doorbell. The world was shocked when a Baton Rouge jury found Pierce not guilty of manslaughter. Was Pierce justified in defending himself and his home with deadly force? Or was it an unjustified overreaction? Meet Piers and judge for yourself as you watch this 1993 report. Once again, the eyes of the world were upon the violence in our society. Of course, no country's scrutiny was more intense than Japan's. There, violent crime is far less frequent than in the U.S., and only the police and military are allowed to have guns. So there were endless news reports trying to explain the unexplainable. The Japanese press poured into Louisiana where Yoshi was shot and beamed back images of a country where private citizens possessed millions of firearms. It's not just the verdict which has been hotly debated, but also the meaning of Yoshi's death. Is his loss an American disgrace? Another example of the results of our violence-ridden society. Or, as Rodney Pierce and his lawyer, Louis Unglesby, believe, simply a one-of-a-kind tragedy. It's a one-in-a-million thing. Everything had to go wrong simultaneously for these two people to collide in the universe the way that they did. It was in central Louisiana, a predominantly white suburb of Baton Rouge, where Yoshi was killed. At that time, Rodney Pierce was living in this ranch-style house in central with his wife, Bonnie, their son, Ryan, and Bonnie's son from a previous marriage. Rodney grew up on a farm outside of Baton Rouge in a family that was accustomed to having guns in their home for hunting, and protecting family and property. Prior to Yoshi's death, Rodney never had a run-in with the law. When Rodney and Yoshi had their deadly encounter, Yoshi was 16 and had been in America for two months as part of his student exchange program. Friends and family say he was fascinated by America. He lived with Dick and Holly Haymaker and their 16-year-old son, Webb, in Baton Rouge. In the early evening, Webb and Yoshi were home dressing up for a Halloween party that night in Central. What was the mood? What was the plan? I'm in my room. Yoshi walks in and says, Mom, can you help me with this outfit? He's just all, all excited and ready to go because he's going to be John Travolta. It was very upbeat. Yoshi, dressing up as the John Travolta character in Saturday Night Fever, wore a white tuxedo jacket. It was evening when he and Webb set out for the party with Webb driving. Webb says they arrived in Central somewhere around 8 o'clock. And we saw the house, and we saw a house, and the address was close. And they had three cars in the driveway and Halloween uh, decorations all around. So we thought that this would probably be the place. Webb now says that when he and Yoshi arrived at the Piers home at 10311 East Brookside, they had made a mistake confusing two addresses that are similar. The party actually was down the block at 10131 East Brookside, just five doors away. This confusion is how the trouble began. Bonnie Pierce was inside with her family. And when I heard the doorbell ring, I got up, put my house coat on, and I went to answer the door. I turned on the porch light and uh, looked out through the blinds we heard them at the side door because they were they were clanking the blinds. So we walked towards the side door. And then I opened the door and I saw a person. He was all bandaged up like he'd been in a car wreck. I didn't know uh, what kind of help they needed. It was Webb who was all bandaged up. He was wearing this collar because of a neck injury and for his Halloween costume, he had added a bandage to his head. Then all of a sudden, a second person come, came from around the corner real fast. And I'd say within a, a second or two, something just told me this isn't right. Instinctively, yes, you sir. felt fear. Because if someone's running towards you, then it must mean they mean harm. And I slammed the door and I locked it. So we were confused and we walked away. Webb says they figured the party wasn't here, so they set out to find it, unaware of just how alarmed Bonnie was. And before I realized it, 
I'd holler for Rodney to get the gun. Your phrase, get the gun, was unusual. Yes, sir. What were you thinking? Why get the gun? I wasn't even thinking. Um, I had problems with dealing with that because that's, that's just not something I say. Bonnie says she deeply regrets she didn't call 911 instead and says she cannot comprehend why she didn't do so. But Holly and others think there may have been a reason. Perhaps Bonnie was startled to see a minority outside her home. I have w often wished that we'd had a French boy or a Norwegian boy because I'm not so sure that that boy would have been shot. In what way? Do you think it contributed to her fear? Yeah. Looking she outside said, and seeing an unfamiliar face? Yeah, she said, I knew he was darker than me. At the trial, while giving a description of Yoshi, Bonnie testified that, quote, I guess he appeared oriental. He could have been Mexican or whatever. And, quote, he was taller than me and his skin was darker colored. Now think of what happened. The moment um, Bonnie saw Webb, she thought nothing was unusual. She then saw Yoshi, and within a half a second, the door was slammed and get your gun, was said. Some in Baton Rouge believe Bonnie may have thought Yoshi was a light-skinned black man. I didn't believe he was black. Even if he was, that wouldn't have had anything to do with it. It was his fast movement toward that door that scared me so bad, not the color of his skin. Bonnie's fear was contagious. You know, it was terror. I could see this fear that I'd never seen before, and actually her telling me to go get the gun. Uh, I didn't ask any questions. Rodney ran to his bedroom closet to get this gun, which he legally possessed, a 44 caliber Magnum Smith & Wesson pistol with an 8-inch barrel and a hunting scope. The deadly weapon was loaded and ready to fire when they rushed back to the door. Rodney then looked through the blinds, and although he saw no one there, he opened the door. You looked through the blinds and you saw there was no one there. Why didn't you just call the police? Did that thought enter your mind? Uh, no, I didn't. That, at that time, it did not enter my mind. The jury believed Rodney's decision made sense. That was their property. They own that. They have the right to protect it. They have the right to go outside the door anytime they want to. The district attorney who prosecuted the Yoshi Atori case said that Rodney Pierre's biggest mistake was opening his front door. The story continues when Justice Files return.